Hi. Okay, we can finally get this show on the road. I've spent half the day fiddling with all of these various settings. By the way, can you tell that I just watched the lighting tutorial? I've got like six different lights going on. Um, if you've clicked on this video, you are probably wondering what kind of person lets a teddy bear stop them from going to their graduation. Spoilers, apparently I'm that kind of person. But you need some context or else you're gonna think I'm crazy. So let's start where every good story starts from the very beginning. <laughs> That was so cheesy. Actually, let's not go back to the very beginning, but the beginning of my time at university, the beginning of my relationship with the University of Melbourne, my university. So my first impressions of university were much like everyone else's. You know, um, I went on orientation day and there were so many people, there was so much hustle and bustle. I was in love at first sight. Right? There were so many people to talk to. Everyone had their own interesting, you know, thing going on. And all the clubs had pitched tents just outside the old quad, you know, that grassy area. I don't remember what it's called, but it's like next to that little stream of water that everyone thinks about jumping over, but nobody ever, you know, gets the guts to do it. But there were so many tents there and so many clubs. I think on that first day, I signed up to like seven or eight clubs. I spent like a hundred dollars, right? It's like $10 per club. And every time I went up to, uh, went up to one of the tents, the members would be so passionate and they'd pitch it like this was the best club. The point is the people were great and the campus was so beautiful on first viewing. I mean, Melbourne University, if you've never been, Parkville is a beautiful campus. I passed that first semester in relative peace. You know, I was quite happy. Um, everything seemed to be clicking, but reality started to kick in after the first semester. And it started to kick in after first semester, specifically <laughs> when I got my first bill. Um, for the classes that I'd taken. Now, I was doing a Bachelor of Arts and arts degrees are at the cheaper end of the scale. But when I got my bill, every subject was still around about $3,400 to $3,700. I mean, this year they raised it to $3,900 for an arts subject. So, I mean, those are the figures that I found and I'll be using those. Every arts subject that I did was $3,950. Um, that was more money than I had on me at the time. So I sort of did a double take. And then there was a moment of confusion because I was like, well, I've been having a great time and my teachers are great, but we're an art students. You know, I was a philosophy major. Most of what we're doing is sitting around inside classrooms talking. <laughs> like, how does that become so expensive? So I ran the numbers. Okay, $3,950 per arts class. Normally the way that arts courses work is that you have tutorials and you have lectures and you usually have around 11 lectures, 11 tutorials. Numbers may vary a little bit, but that's how it worked. So I calculated with 11 tutorials and 11 lectures and a total cost of $3,950, the hourly cost of being in that course would come to $180 per hour. So that conversation you had in that really nice tutorial where you sat around with a bunch of your friends and talked, $180 for that. That lecture that wasn't particularly engaging and you snoozed a little bit, $180. Now, I ran some further numbers. At those rates, with a tutorial, let's say about 17 to 20 people, um, each tutorial would be making $3,600 net, you know, before expenses, obviously. And the numbers for lectures gets even more wonky because normally like a lecture hall is anywhere from, you know, 200 to 500 people, right? So going with like 300 at $180 per hour multiplied by 300 people, that's $54,000 an hour per lecture. Bear in mind, I am an art student. I majored in philosophy. So there is a chance that I've completely messed up the numbers here. Part of me wonders, even if I messed up, I couldn't have messed up that badly, right? Anyway, so it was a bit of a sour pill to swallow, you know, first year and already I'm like $12,000 in debt, minus the hex fee. So I'm about half that, like $6,000 in debt, more money again than I had at the time. But I sort of consoled myself, I guess, by thinking, well, if it means that the teachers are paid well um, and that they're supported, then well, you know, hex is a thing, we can work it off, right? We'll go into the workforce and do our bit and whatnot. At least that's how I justified it. But one day, it just so happened that I was talking to one of my favorite tutors about this subject, you know, a really fantastic lady. I was talking to this teacher about the pricing and what was going on. And I asked her how well they must be getting paid, kind of jokingly, 
because you know if the lectures are making five thousand fifty four thousand dollars per hour and the tutes are making three thousand six hundred dollars an hour then the university must be paying quite well they aren't <laughs> Is the, is, the, is the short answer of it. They're not. So looking at the university's published ABP sessional hourly rates, um, an initial lecture is paid at $208, including two hours of working time. And a repeat lecture is paid at $138 with one hour of working time. Tutorials are even worse because tutorial is paid at $148 for an initial tutorial with two hours of associated working time and $99 for a repeat tutorial with one hour of associated working time. Now, the first thing that comes to mind is two hours to prepare a lecture. Are you kidding? <laughs> That's just a completely unfeasible amount of time. And the fact that the university only like pays for two hours worth of preparation time is kind of bonkers. Because if you think about it, a lecture usually goes on for about an hour, right? And an hour of pretty much solid talking. If we calculate like, you know, roughly for me, I speak pretty fast. 800 words is about five minutes for me, right? 800 times by um, 12 is, quick maths, uh, 9,600 9, words per lecture. That's like writing an honors thesis every single time that you need to like give a lecture. I mean, obviously these professors know what they're doing, right? But that's still an awful lot of work to only be given two hours of paid stuff for. And the second thing that is surprising is Where's all that money going? The students are paying so much. Like I said, every lecture is $54,000, right? And every tutorial is $3,600. Why are the tutors only been being paid like $200 for a lecture? <laughs> Where's all this money going? That was my big question, you know? And unfortunately, the further I got into university, the darker the picture became, right? That initial sort of impression the green lawn, um, all these students being so happy and the teachers and everything. The further I went into university, the more I realized that was a carefully constructed facade. Obviously not in the parts of the people who were there. I mean, I don't think they were aware of it, but just part of how the university positioned themselves. The more I looked into it, the more I realized, for instance, the university has a history of wage theft. And this wage theft is related to what I was talking to you about before. Two hours to prepare a lecture, two hours for an initial tutorial, one hour for a repeat tutorial. I mean, think about it. Imagine trying to mark 20 something pieces of work in an hour. You'd have no time at all. The more I found out about it, the more I realized this is actually an intentional tactic that the university used to crush costs and maximize profits. But other things sort of started striking closer to home. I realized the tutors have it really, really tough, right? The university has a history of casualizing their workforce, moving them from part-time contracts onto casual contracts which means they don't have any job security and which means they may not get like regular work hours. Tutorial sizes started increasing. In my first year, I remember my tutorials were about 17 people. And then in the second year, they became 24 people. And then in the third year, they got rid of tutorials altogether and it was just like 70 person seminars. All of these things started piling up throughout my degree and I became more and more jaded about the whole university experience. I realized that we are here the students and the teachers. And we're trying to carry on um, this idea of education, you know, this notion of uh, self-development and improvement and the preservation of human knowledge. And meanwhile, the university is kind of just playing Monopoly, <laughs> right? That's what they're doing on the side. I suppose the straw that snapped the camel's back, if you pardon the use of a cliche, is last year, right? 2020, COVID year. Um, times were tough, everyone was doing it tough. Around about um, July, when I went back to, to do a bit of my honors degree, I received a letter from the University of Melbourne. Now, initially I figured maybe this was the university reaching out to offer some support to their students during um, a very difficult time. And then I opened the letter and inside was not support, but rather my student services and amenities fee, which if you don't go to Melbourne University, you know is a fee that among other things is sort of for campus amenities that you might use when you're at university. I was pretty shocked <laughs> because here we are in these times and there's all this chaos going around in the world. And yet this letter, this bill still managed to find it to me on time. More than that, the university still expected me to pay for a campus that I hadn't set foot on. 
amenities that in most cases I hadn't used and services that hadn't really been offered to me. That was, like I said, the straw that broke the camel's back because while I stood there holding this letter in my hand, everything kind of made sense. You know, the entire picture came into focus and I realized a very simple truth. They don't care about me. The university does not care about me. And so I guess that's why in the months that followed, I wasn't as surprised with what they did. It was only a few weeks later that they started firing off staff members. You know those staff members that they had previously moved from part-time to casual contracts? Now they were able to let them go with very little warning and very little assistance in what was probably the worst catastrophe of the last 50 years. And this also goes for their refusal to reimburse students for their study fees. You know, given that everything was online now, the university did a curious double take because all throughout my degree, I remember the university saying, you have to go to your classes, you have to go to your lectures, because if you're not there in person, the quality of the education is not the same. It suffers. And then all of a sudden last year, the university does a 180 and says adamantly, no, the quality of the education is completely consistent, even though everyone's online now, and even though we've downsized our teaching force, you don't deserve a refund of any kind. <laughs> the University of Melbourne posted an $8 million surplus during the COVID pandemic. $8 million. And I mean, that's in addition to the billions of dollars that they're known to have in savings. With all that money, why do they still go after those teachers? Even though they could have, and they knew they could have kept them on, they still let them go. Why? Well, the only reason I can think of is the same reason they keep increasing their tutorial sizes. The same reason they're so desperate to get international students as many as they can get, regardless of you know, whether it's in their best interests or whether the course is suitable for them or whether they can afford it. Profits. At the end of the day, that's what it comes down to. The university doesn't care about me. The university doesn't care about you. The university cares about profits. And that's what I was to them. I was that $313 services and amenities fee. I was the $3,900 course fee. I was the $30,000, $40,000 in student debt at the end of my degree. That's what they saw. Duncan Maskell, the vice chancellor, never came down and talked to me, never got to know me as a person. Duncan Maskell just knows me as a number. And the bottom line is they only care about their bottom line. So with all this preamble in place, maybe it is a bit clearer now why I didn't go to graduation. When graduation came around, let me finish this little story. I was sent another letter by the University of Melbourne, a bill. Of course, the university never just sends me letters. It's a bit of an abusive relationship, isn't it? They just care about you when they need more money. But they sent me another bill, $165 to attend the ceremony. I figured I'm already $30,000 in debt. What's another $165? Might as well go. It's my graduation, right? So I went onto the website and went through all the pages and I'll never forget this because it's so ridiculous. It sounds like it came out of um, some kind of satire. But just as I was about to click that last checkout button, a pop-up came up and in that pop-up was a picture of a teddy bear with a graduation cap and scroll and a love heart that said, I heart uni Mel. I mean, it would have been cute in any other instance, but it was the caption that really got me. And the caption said in like the most textbook marketing jargon you could possibly imagine, commemorate your special time at the University of Melbourne with this limited edition teddy bear, $49.95. And maybe I'm making too big of a deal out of this, but I just couldn't swallow that. <laughs> At the very end, that was the one thing I couldn't take. I realized with visceral clarity that this is what I was to the university. I was a cash cow. <laughs> They'd been milking me throughout the entirety of my degree and even here at the very end, at my very own graduation, at the very last moment, actually, just as I was about to pay my last fee to the university, they still wanted to squeeze every last drop that they could out of me. And then I got to thinking about the graduation itself. And then I realized that my classes were so big, I was graduating with so many people that finding my friends would have been like searching for a needle in a haystack. Second cliche, if you can forgive that. This graduation wasn't about me, I mean, that much was clear. With the other several thousand people who were graduating at the same time, I realized the graduation was really a consumerist event. 
it was another commodity that the university was trying to sell to me. I wouldn't gain any knowledge. I wouldn't become any smarter. I wouldn't be made better by this. It was pure consumerism. That's all it was. Consumerism and maybe a photo op. And I couldn't stomach it. Not what they were selling. There is a psychological phenomenon called Stockholm Syndrome. I'm sure most of you are familiar. Um, it's like Belle from Beauty and the Beast. It's when you fall in love with your kidnapper or you know your abuser because they give you brief moments of empathy or kindness. I realized that my relationship with the university was one resembling Stockholm Syndrome. The things that I fell in love with when I was at university, the momentary kindnesses, they were never given to me by the university. It was almost always because of the people that I was interacting with, the teachers that I got to talk to, the friends that I made in those tutorials. It had nothing to do with the university itself, nothing to do with the institution that pockets $54,000 per hour and pays teachers $208 had nothing to do with that institution who spends $16 million on marketing and yet still can't afford to keep on their staff members in the middle of a catastrophe. That institution was nothing but abusive to me. And so I suppose to finish this video on a positive note, I think the important thing that we realize is that really the essence of education, what we have, is very special. And as with almost all good things in the world, it's not expensive. It's something that can be freely given anywhere, anytime. So long as there is a teacher willing to teach and a student willing to learn, education can occur anywhere. It could be in a cafe, on the street corner, in a park, in someone's house. We don't need these big, grandiose buildings and these huge campuses and these monolithic universities to preserve education. If anything, these things have become a hindrance to education. I think it's time that we reclaimed what was rightfully ours and stop letting universities make a quick profit off of education. Until I see you again, thanks for watching. Hello, um, I'm editing the video right now and I packed up all of the lighting equipment so I can't like film with the proper camera, but I wanted to show you something. You see, this here is a teddy bear that I've had since I was born. Um, and I guess what I'm trying to say is that real emotional connections can't be faked. You know, if someone or something doesn't care about you, then they just don't care. But Teddy, on the other hand, does. <laughs> See you next time.